Good morning. I know we still have people standing in the back. If you want to sit, feel free to come on down. Welcome back. It's really good to be back together again in chapel. Your presence and your worship is a great encouragement to me, so I just thank you for that. We're studying the Minor Prophets this uh, semester, which I have to admit is something of a challenge for me. I'm not a former preacher, a formal preacher. I'm a lay preacher. And I've been going to church for my entire life, and I don't think I've ever heard a series on the Minor Prophets. Moreover, I have to confess, I still have a hard time finding them in the Bible. <laughs> I get to Daniel, and then I just keep leaping through until I find the right one. Finally, the Minor Prophets are kind of a downer. The basic premise is that God sends a prophet to tell his people how much they've messed up. Not the most upbeat message for the beginning of the semester. So, however, as Christians, we believe that all scripture is God-breathed and good for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. So I think it's fitting that we look at the minor prophets this semester. I've chosen to open with Amos, and I would ask for you to think and turn with me, if you have Bibles, to two sections in Amos. First, Amos 5, 21 through 24, and then we'll be at Amos 7, 7 through 9. So first, Amos 5, 21 through 24. Hear the word of God. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Chapter 7. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And he said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never, pass, I never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before we look at these particular passages, we should have a little bit of historical context about who Amos is and when he's writing. Amos was a prophet in the 750s during the time of Jeroboam II, the last king of Israel's long dynasty. It was a time of great peace and prosperity in Israel. Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon, all the big countries around Israel, were relatively weak during this time. So Israel had gained control of the international trade routes. Moreover, they had agricultural crops that were flourishing. So it was time of great wealth. More people were moving from the country into towns and cities, and if you had access to food from the country, you could sell it at a really high price to people living in the cities. This uh, prosperity led to people accumulating great amounts of wealth, and they also led to some to live decadent lifestyles. Moreover, Amos suggests throughout his book that the rich made their money by exploiting the poor and subverting justice. There was a growing gap between the rich and the poor. And Amos surely criticizes foreign nations for their participation in this unjust system, but his greatest criticism is for Israel, for God's chosen people. Now, Amos' historical context might strike some of us a little bit too close to home. For no matter how much money any of us have in our wallets or our bank accounts, if you were right now here in this chapel, you were living in a wealthy nation in a time of prosperity and relative peace. We have access to clean water, improved sanitation, good health care, safe food, housing to protect us against the weather, and perhaps most importantly, you have access to education, which gives you lots of power to control and improve your life. There's a wonderful website that's called If the World Was 100 People, and it illustrates the demographics 
and the distribution of resources among the seven billion people in the world. So, for example, it says, if the world was 100 people, 50 would be men and 50 would be women. Consider some of the other facts. If the world was 100 people, five would be from North America. Five would speak English as their first language. 63% would have a high school degree, but only seven would have a college degree. And in 2006, that was one. And the big change has come through higher education in Asia. 75 would have cell phones, but only 22 would have computers. Now consider the facts the other way around. If the world was 100 people, 48 would live on $2 a day. One out of two children live in poverty. 13 would have no consistent clean water. 16 would have no access to a toilet. 22, no access to electricity. 23, no shelter from the rain. One would be starving, and 15 would be undernourished. And 33 out of these 100 people would be our brothers and sisters in Christ. We too live in a world where there's a great disparity between rich and poor, between those who have resources and those that do not. So perhaps Amos has something to say to us. And now that I've helped us all feel really guilty and somewhat overwhelmed by the world's uh, disparities, let us see what the prophet has to say to us. I'm afraid we're heading down before we head up on this sermon. This book of Amos is a collection of many sermons. They're called prophetic oracles. And they're just sort of a collection of it. They're not, you know, you have a couple chapters have a sermon or sometimes it's three sermons in one chapter. Amos uses a variety of metaphors. And one of those metaphors is a plumb line. Now, I know there's at least 30 or 40 of you know how to use a plumb line because we have a great construction management program. But in case you don't, I brought my, my own plumb line. Well, I brought Jim Caldwell's plumb line. This is a plumb line. And that on the bottom there is called the plumb bob. And so what you would do to make a straight wall is you would tack this up two inches from the wall at the top and then you'd measure two inches at the bottom and you would see whether your, lo- your wall was vertically straight. If you don't get the wall vertically straight, likely it won't be able to support the weight. You won't be able to hung, hang doors or windows straight. You might have the whole structure collapse, right? So the plumb line is really important to constructing a good building. Um, the parallels with Amos are obvious. He says that God is setting a plumb line in the midst of his people, Israel, to see if their lives are aligned with God's ways, to test whether they're keeping their covenant promises to God. Determine whether their lives are crooked crooked or straight. And God finds out that the people of Israel fail the test. They've not followed God's ways. They are curved in on themselves because they're too, they're too selfish. They are bent so that they stay away from caring for others. So accordingly, Amos declares the structures of their culture, their high places and their sanctuaries will be destroyed and the house of Jeroboam will come under sword. Now this metaphor of the plumb line works really easy in construction. You make a vertical line, you use gravity, use the weight, but how does it work in our lives? What exactly does God's plumb line look like in our life? Amos helps to answer that question in our second passage. Now, you might reasonably, and I might reasonably assume that if you want our lives to be plumb with God, you participate in worship. You go to church, you get your chapel credits. You join a Bible study. You're in the worship band. You give your tithe. That would be all a good start to getting your life in plumb with God. However, while all those overt acts of worship are in religious practice might be necessary, they're not sufficient. Listen to what Amos says God says about our religious practices. God hates and despises your feast. He has no delight in your solemn assemblies. He rejects the burnt offerings and the grain offerings. And then he says, take away from me the noise of your songs. 
to the melody of your harps I will not listen. Amos says that all of our wonderful religious worship means little if it does not affect the way we live. A claim that, again, strikes me a little too close to home after we just had wonderful worship. So how should we live? What is God's true plumb line? Amos' last verse gives us that, that plumb line. He says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Justice and righteousness, fairness and piety, impartiality and virtue. Often we tend to want to emphasize one or the other of those two things. So we're going to advocate for justice for refugees. We're going to be about justice. But we might be okay with cheating on our homework. No righteousness. Or we could never imagine breaking the community covenant, never get drunk. But we really don't care about the person who's poor that lives next to us. No justice. We're faithful in our marriages, righteousness, but we resent taking care of a family member who's a pain. No justice. Of course, sometimes we fail on both fronts. So we joke about a person who's different from us. No difference. No righteousness, I mean. Which reinforces racial stereotypes and undermines opportunity. No justice. Amos is calling the people of Israel, and by extension us, to live consistent lives of justice and righteousness. And notice Amos' metaphor. He wants us to be a consistent stream of justice and righteousness. We should not be a dry creek that only flows with righteousness and justice when people are watching what we're doing or when there's a presidential election or when there's some big issue that's on social media or the news. Our lives should be quiet, steady streams of justice and righteousness that helps us that everyone we meet will flourish, help us to have everyone flourish. Now, throughout the rest of the book, Amos, in a variety of places, says how we treat our neighbors who are poor is a significant test about whether we're in plumb with God's ways. And you don't have to look at this passage, but I'll give you an example. In example two, Amos writes that the Lord will not revoke his punishment against Israel for four reasons. He says, first, because they sell the righteous for silver and a needy for a pair of sandals. They were literally selling people into slavery for the cost of sandals, and they were treating them like property. Second, they trample the head of the poor in the dust of the earth and turn away the signs, the, 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 the needs of the afflicted. The people of Israel just ignored people who were in need. Third, a man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. Now, this is an example not just of condemning sexual sin. It also likely refers to a man and his son going to a temple prostitutes, women who were often very poor and basically sex slaves. Un injustice. And fourth, they lay themselves down beside an altar on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of God they drink wine of those who have been fined. Again, we need a little cultural history to understand that one. Poor people at this time, if they had a debt, in order to pay back their debt, they would give their coat to the person they owed the money. And they would only get the, the coat back uh, when they had finished paying the debt. But the rich person was supposed to give the coat back every night so that they would not be cold when they slept. And so what this says is the rich person kept the coat at night and let the poor person be cold. Similarly, it says that they extorted the poor people to pay wine as for their fines, and then they used that wine to get drunk in the house of God. Amos says God will not revoke his punishment for this injustice. Okay, so now you're saying to yourself, okay, President Part, I get it. People of Israel are bad people. They messed up. God's mad at them, but ease up. It's the beginning of the semester. This is depressing. I am already a poor college student. I understand poverty, right? <laughs> My dad and I are not sleeping with temple prostitutes. <laughs> I am not stealing people's coats. I'm not turning away from the afflicted. I'm not taking advantage of the poor. I am the poor. Look at my tuition bill. <laughs> what does Amos have to do with me? 
may I gently suggest a few possible parallels. Perhaps you're not sleeping with temp t temple prostitutes. But have you ever downloaded pornography, which not only warps your sense of God's gift of sexuality, but also encourages an industry that exploits and degrades men and women, many of whom are poor? Perhaps you're not stealing people's coats. But should you look into your closet and maybe give away one or two coats to somebody who might really need it? Perhaps you have not personally away, turned away a person in need. But are you worried that most immigrants are here to take away American jobs? Perhaps you don't think you've taken advantage of the poor. But have you ever stiffed a waiter on a tip? The federal minimum hourly wage for a waiter is $2.13. So if you didn't pay a tip, that's what they're making. I have a friend who's in the restaurant business, and she said one of the saddest witnesses of the Christian church is people who come into a restaurant, make a big deal about praying before their meal, and then tip way below average. And I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself. I fail in this way all the time. I'm, I'm getting ready for this sermon. And last Saturday night, I went out to dinner with my family, another family, and some of our grad assistants. And Carrie, who was a much better person than I, suggested that I pick up the tab for the grad assistants. But you know what? I was just too preoccupied with my own problems and what I was thinking about and my own self to pay much attention, so I didn't. And the next day in church, we came to the time of confession. And I was completely convicted by the Holy Spirit. Our grad students do a lot of great work at JBU. And I was not even willing to pick up the cost of a couple of pizzas. I was selfish and I was stingy and I confessed my sin. Now I know many of you, and me too, don't like sermons in which you start to feel guilty. But actually I think guilt's okay sometimes. Unless we are convicted by our sin, we never need a savior. Unless we see ourselves falling short of God's ideal ourselves, we rarely can have compassion for other people that are falling short. Unless we realize how much Christ has done for us and be grateful for that, it's hard for, to break our tendency to be selfish and think of others. The more we think we're okay, the less likely we think about others. So I offer these examples because they really tell us that there's no way to solve this problem on our own. We'll never line up to God's plumb line. We're always crooked. We are caught both personally and systemically in broken networks that are unjust and unrighteous and which God hates and will judge. Hmm, good news. So where then is our hope? Our only hope is Christ. And Amos points to him in chapter 9. In the final sermon in this book, Amos writes about the end times. He writes about the new heaven and the new earth. And this is what he says. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches. And I will raise up the ruins and I will rebuild it as days of old. Amos is talking about the restoration of David's kingdom. However, this new kingdom will be better than any kingdom that David experienced. In this new kingdom... He says, they may, put, they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by his name. Again, we need historical context to understand that. Edom was the people that were perpetually at war with Israel. They were never reconciled with Israel. They were always in battle. But in the new kingdom, they will be reconciled. Moreover, not just Edom will be reconciled. All the people of the nations will be reconciled. This is the justice for which we all should long. And this is the justice that will characterize this new kingdom. In our cultural context, context, it will be the kingdom of justice for unarmed black men and for the police. A kingdom of justice for the refugees in Syria and Sudan and for the homeless in Siloam and San Francisco. 
a kingdom of justice in which no 14-year-old boys blow themselves up in terrorist attacks. And no nations look to close their borders. And this new kingdom will not just be a kingdom of justice. It will also be a kingdom of plenty because the created world will be healed and restored to new abundance and glory. Hold on a sec. (laughs) Amos writes, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed. The mountain shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. Lots of Amos' poetry, and I love poetry, so I gotta explain the poetry to you. Again, we need a bit of cultural history. In Palestine, people would plow in October. They would sow their seeds in December. They would harvest in March the wheat, and then they would harvest the grapes in June. So what this is really saying is the plowing will start in October, and the guy that was reaping in March will still be working. Right? The guy, person who's treading grapes in June will still be treading their grapes in December when the, they're starting to sow the seeds. It'll be just one big, huge harvest in agricultural Uh, plenty. Moreover, the barren mountains will produce sweet wine and it will flow down like streams from the mountains. In this new kingdom, there will be no scarcity. There will be no hunger. There will be no starvation. There will be abundance. If the world was a hundred people in the new kingdom, a hundred people would have enough. And then Amos writes, then this new kingdom, ordinary human life will be restored to its intended glory. He says, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine and they will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land and they shall never be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. In this new kingdom, there will be no homelessness. There will be no loneliness. There will be no depression. There will be no need for migration. There will be no more death. Amos offers us a picture of the new heaven and the new earth. It's not a heaven in which we float around on clouds and read each other's minds. It's ordinary life, but it's lived to its fullest. We'll eat together. We'll drink together. We'll play together. We'll play ultimate frisbee together. We'll dance together. We'll talk together. We'll live together in full harmony with God's justice and righteousness. It will be the kind of life that we do at JBU when we're at our best. It will be heaven on earth because our lives will be fully aligned with God's plumb line. Now, how could this ever come about? We're way too crooked. We're so bent. We're so unjust. We're so unrighteous. So Amos has this vision of the future kingdom, but he doesn't know how it's going to come about. However, You turn to Acts 15, and the council of Jerusalem is trying to just figure out what are they going to do with these Gentile Christians. They've always been on the outside. And James declares in the temple, uh, in the council, that the Gentiles should be part of the church, and he cites Amos 9. And when he cites Amos 9, what is he saying? He's saying Jesus is the new king that will bring about the new kingdom. Jesus is the one who not only will save the people of Israel, but he'll save all the Gentiles. When they quote it in in Acts, they don't say Edom, they say Gentiles. It's all the Gentiles. He'll reconcile all people to himself. Jesus is the one who will restore the new heaven and the earth. Jesus is the king who will bring about the abundant, ordinary life of Amos 9. But notice, how does Jesus bring about this life? He is rich and he becomes poor. He goes from a place of fellowship with God in heaven to be born as a person in a feeding trough in a stable. He and his family soon become refugees as they flee to Egypt from a tyrant. He lives an ordinary life for 30 years and he begins his public ministry and he hangs out with all the wrong people. Tax collectors, prostitutes, lepers, women with five husbands, people with illness and demon possession, and a ragbag group of ordinary fishermen. And then just about the time that everybody thinks he's going to take over as king, he too is sold 
for 30 pieces of silver. He too was trampled, beaten, and exploited by religious and political leaders. He too faced the injustice of a court system that was rigged. Everything about his trial is illegal. He too was convicted by a mob. He too was stripped naked. He too was put on a cross and suffered and died. Why? Jesus comes not to bring judgment, but to receive judgment. He comes not as a conquering king, but as a victim of injustice, as one of the oppressed, as a poor man who had no room to lay his head. God so hates injustice and so loves us that he sent his only son to absorb the injustice of this world so that we would not perish but have eternal life. Christ receives condemnation that he didn't deserve so that we could receive the justice and righteousness that he did. So what does that mean? We can't be passive about injustice and unrighteousness because Jesus was not passive. He lived righteously. He strove for justice, not for himself, but for others. So we should be willing to work for justice and righteousness ourselves. We are Christians saved by grace. So we do not act righteously or seek justice because somehow we earn God's love. We can't. We seek justice and act righteously because it's a sign that we are the followers of Jesus Christ. It's a sign that we are his people and he is our king. It's a sign that we're on his team and that we wear the color of his jersey. It is a sign that we are looking forward to that new king. Justice and righteousness is what it looks like to be a Christian. Again, you're saying to yourself, okay, President Pollard, you're getting all worked up. (laughs) I'm glad this sermon has gotten a little less kind of depressing and (laughs) guilt-producing. I know that I need to be like Jesus and care more about justice and righteousness, but I got to go to chemistry class after chapel. And then I got a work-study job. And then I got to go to dinner. So really, what do you want me to do? How does this work? How can you be practical? Do you want me to quit college and go serve in a food kitchen? It's a fair question. So let me give you a few examples of what you are already doing to think to bring about righteousness and justice. So here's a picture of our Enactus team. On the left, or, uh, oops, gotta turn this on just a sec. Uh, That's them just knowing they're gonna get into the final four. That's them praying before the final four. That's them taking the questions. But this is what I really wanna show you. Yellow crate. What's yellow crate? Well, crate, if I hope I can explain this right, is an app that you can have on your phone so that when you walk into a grocery store, you'll get a message, and it'll be linked to what is needed in the food pantry in your community. So they would, you get an app, and they say, we need diapers. So you can pick up an extra pair of diapers, and you can drop it in the yellow crate, and it will go to the food pantry. That was developed by JVU students. That is aligning what you're doing in college with those who are in need. Here's another example. This is a stove that can be used. It's being developed by one of our alumni in Chile. Uh, Less pollution uh, and also more fuel efficient. And the Enactus folks are working out how to get that in production. So one example. Here's another example. This is a group of students who went to Guatemala with one of our alumni. I think there's six or seven students. And they were trying to figure out how to do language institutes in rural Guatemala. Remember, only five out of the 100 people speak English as their first language. But the power of English for economic advancement is overwhelming. If you can learn English, you can make a better life. A couple pictures from there. And here's a real simple one. This is our soccer team. You know, in the springtime, they run clinics for like two or 300 kids. It's complete chaos. Think 200, 300 kids with balls going every which way and everything else, right? But our soccer players are rich in their skill in soccer. And they give it to those who are poor in our community. And here's a final example. This is from uh, Dr. Messery. He started a publishing company for people that can't be published. He's got 12 books out so far. And he takes one dollar from the sale of every one of those books and he uses that to buy books and computers for two orphanages in Ghana and Nigeria, okay? 
aligning your work with the needs of other people. You're smart. You're here. You're imaginative. You can do it. And I got to tell you, these things are not new to JBU. Dr. John Brown Sr. founded this school to give poor kids a chance to go to college and to learn about righteousness. Justice and righteousness are in the DNA of this place. God has called you to be a college student right now, and that means you should go to class, you should do your homework, you should get to sleep. However, he's also calling you to spend your life to benefit other people. You may not be rich in cash right now, but you're rich in something. You may be rich in experiences or clothes or because you have a car or because you're emotionally stable or because you're cool. Literally, every, almost every college student is cool to a middle school person. <laughs> or because of your knowledge or because of your athletic ability or because of the ability to have friends. Who can you help with your abundance? Align your life to spend generously on them. And if you really don't know anybody that has need, you need a larger group of friends. And alternatively, where are you poor? And how can you humble yourself to ask others to help you in need? Because just because we might be rich or educated doesn't mean we're not poor in many, many ways. And other people need to help us. The more we align our lives with God's righteousness and justice, the more likely our lives will be aligned with God's plumb line. Some people say that your college years are the best years in your life. I think your college years at JBU should be a glimpse of the best years of your next life. A glimpse of the new kingdom that's imagined in Amos 9 where our ordinary lives flourish because we seek to live justly and righteously to give glory to Christ our King. May it always be true of us at JBU. Amen.